want to fend for myself, and I, I want to build people up for them to fend for themselves. Hey everybody, I am Clark Fredericks, the host of the Free Like Me podcast. I am also the coach in the Free Like Me coaching program I've developed to take people with unresolved sexual abuse and get them off a of hell island and onto heaven island where we all want to reside. I ask all of you, when you watch these uh, podcasts, to hit the subscribe button so that I can increase my followers and continue to get amazing guests. Today's guest is Father Robert Griner of a priest at Grace Church in Madison, New Jersey, and also the spiritual advisor at Alina Lodge, a substance abuse center in Blairstown, New Jersey. Uh, it's going to be an amazing show. Well, let's find out why he's here and what we're going to talk about. Father Griner, welcome. Clark, what a pleasure to be here <laughs> with you. It really is. I want to start off by sounding a little biased. I picture a priest being raised in the Beaver Cleaver family. Just everybody's so happy and perfect. <laughs> you're an Eagle Scout. You've never looked at pornography. You're drank or did drugs. You're just straight laced. Everything in your world is perfect. Am I getting close? <laughs> well, Clark, if that was the case, then I wouldn't be here today, uh -huh. would I? <laughs> <laughs> Which, we are on to something. <laughs> what you had right was I had two very loving parents who never really spared the kind of praise. And they told me how proud they were of me. And um, they were physically affectionate in an appropriate way with me. And uh, my dad must have told me he loved me uh, 200 times. So, uh, so that part is correct. All right. But there was another side of, uh, <laughs> uh, to our family life. There was one of uh, violence and of drunkenness and of uh, tremendous fear uh, growing up. So your father was the one you said told you he loved you. I didn't hear you say he your did. mother told My you. My mother did too. She was a, oh, okay. a, like a perfect kind of Southern Baptist loving mother. And where, who had the uh, drinking problem and violence problem? That would have been my father. Okay. Right? Yeah. So. He and what had, did he do for a living? Uh, he worked for a major corporation, which required us to move a lot. Okay. And so at one point in six years, I lived at six different, um, as he went up the corporate ladder, uh, six different uh, cities and towns. And um, and they were always north-south moves. So um, I learned to pick up a, a southern accent or a northern accent in about a day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but what came with this was this kind of underlying sense of fraudulence, you know? Right. You know, right. that... that You never uh, fit in anywhere. Uh, that's right. And that if they really kind of figured out the truth... Um, about me, then that wouldn't go well. So I became kind of uh, overly concerned with um, not getting found out. Right, right. <laughs> so, so explain, take me into a little insight with, with alcoholism and the violence that was in the household. Yeah. Well, uh, again, to uh, talk about what my dad did right, he way overcame the kind of environment that he grew up in. Okay. That was, um, you know, the, uh, the, the family lived in fear of, of, of death uh, constantly. A explain and, that to me. Um, you, well, my dad would grow up as a little kid, and his father would come in drunk, uh, line up the family against the wall, and pull out a gun. Oh, boy. And threaten to kill them. Wow. So uh, my father never came close to such a thing. Right. Uh, but... Uh, as a product of his own upbringing, he, he kind of had this explosive anger that would uh, spill out at any time, particularly when alcohol was around. And, um, and he was violent towards my mother, uh, put her in the hospital a couple of times. So my biased uh, thought process is a little off base. It is incorrect. <laughs> yes, right, right. But you can see what's happening in terms of the way in which um, my alcoholism developed, you know, with a genetic component in place, you know, check, right. trauma, check, <laughs> a sense of uh, fraudulence. Got that one too. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it was just a matter of time before I put the sort of magic elixir into me, and the angels sang. 
you oh, know, boy. I had the sense of of great relief and like I can breathe now. I found that I I had that same exact feeling the first time I did cocaine. Right. I was like the angle the angels sang all my insecurities just poof, I felt secure and strong. And then as anything that makes you feel that good as alcohol did for you and Coke did for me, it starts to get its claws in you. And then all of a sudden it's uh, not this little magical thing anymore. It, but exactly. before we get to that, I want, let, let's not, let's not fast forward to your destruction yet. <laughs> <laughs> let's not. <laughs> We have plenty of time to hear about your destruction. Yeah. yeah. So take me back. Uh, you know, how was how was your high school years? Did you fit it? When were you doing all this moving six years in a row? What uh, age were we talking? Fortunately for me, the last move as a family was seventh grade for me. Okay. And it was back to a community that I had previously lived in, in Weston, Connecticut. Um, and um, so, uh, the, you know, moving in high school years is a lot uh, rougher. And um, but it was in that time that I started doing a lot of drugs um, to deal with what was inside of me. Yeah, I was a precocious child. I did uh, LSD in seventh grade. Really? I was ahead of the pack <laughs> <laughs> yeah. on my road to becoming a, a priest. <laughs> Yeah. I, I think when I got up to the plate and I took a swig, I did not hit a home run on what <laughs> uh, I envisioned for your you life. You were way off. I about, struck out miserably. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. And uh, so, um, you know. You so, know what that does, though? It makes you relatable. <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> so, it does. I have a lot of friends who definitely relate to wow. my background uh, really? nowadays. Yeah. And, and, yeah. and just from that, from the turmoil of those development years, like you just, is that what, when you like seventh grade, like seventh grade, I started smoking weed. So right. seventh grade, you took the jump to LSD. What, what, like I, I smoked weed to, to put the trauma of the sexual abuse. I had just suffered down. Right. I needed something to, you know, block, block my mind. What were you trying to block? Well, just, um, uh, just that uh, violence, that unpredictability. Absolutely, just that that real uh, innate fear, you know, that um, something's going down that I can't handle, that it's all too much, that it's. Um, I, I I know a guy who referred to it as the overwhelm, you know, that that what I was being asked to do in life was beyond my capacity to do it, and uh, and when I uh, sort of put substances in, in me, that feeling subsided. And it was like, okay, I'm all right, you know, for a while. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Did all right. Your your father's father, basically, was a maniac. Correct. Did you have a relationship with your grandfather? Was he yeah. in your world at all? Did yeah. He and, and plenty he, of this crap with you? Uh, no. He uh, lived in South Georgia, and um, where you know the the kind of culture promotes uh, presenting a public face, right. as many cultures do, <laughs> right. um, and then having a sort of different one on the inside. <laughs> right. Once the door closes, right, right, something right. else is going on. And, uh, you know, so it was that kind of environment that I uh, uh, grew up in. But he, too, was warm and affectionate and uh, loving towards me. Could have his moments. And I never had a, a bad experience with him. Ironically, it's sort of, you know, like my life became full circle. But ironically, he finally got sober at, really? um, in his late 60s, early 70s. This is your grandfather. He did. Right. And, um, and he announced it in front of his Southern Baptist church in Lenox, Georgia, where he came clean um, wow. about the sinfulness of his life. And so he died a sober man. Wow. And how yeah. about your father? Can you um, say, did he do the same? Uh, something like that. It's a little more complicated with him. But um, yeah, he uh, I hadn't seen him drink in decades wow. when he died too so. okay yeah wow so seventh grade we start doing lsd whatever other drugs drinking obviously probably mm -hmm. i would assume yes and, and did you feel like you fit in in high school were you doing were you doing drugs to try to fit in well there was a kind of a double agenda on my part uh one was if everybody is here i was trying to find a way to go here you know, to kind of go above it all, uh, you know, and that is consistent uh, to this day. <laughs> I still were trying to go above it all, you know, so I, I, I wanted to kind of like, you know, be the leader of the pack. And in some ways I was, but at the same time, there was that underlying sense of, of tremendous 
uh, insecurity and uh, that fear of being found out. So these were kind of competing agendas that were kind of ripping me apart, right. you know. And um, it all came to a, um, a a kind of a head when um, the neighbors in my community in the that I lived in they went on uh, vacation, and I knew exactly where their hiding key was. And um, I don't know. We kind of saw it, me and my buddies, as house sitting, uh, but the local <laughs> police uh, saw it as breaking and entering. And, oh, really? Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and this led to sort of court action when I was 15, right. and uh, eventually getting into a, uh, a a drug treatment center. Really? Uh, yeah, up in Norwalk, Connecticut, and uh, my first exposure to recovery. Wow. Yeah. I I, I am almost at a loss of words. Yeah. Right yeah. Now. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> you you are shattering the myth I had of, of, of who becomes a priest. I was a precocious child. <laughs> The other component was, you know, a way that I sort of dealt with my anxiety and insecurity was through academics. I um, sort of did well in school and increasingly better when I got uh, drugs out of the picture. Right. And, um, you know, I ended up um, uh, studying at Oxford University in England. And there my whole world opened up to this this new way of approaching God called Anglicanism or, you know, the Church of England. All right, be, before we get to that, was was religion a part of your family? Very, very much so. Really? Really? Yeah, okay. right. Quite religious, Southern Baptist. And my parents were quite skilled. They were able to find a Southern Baptist church in Connecticut <laughs> <laughs> where people did not talk funny. Right. They talk normal, right, and right. we ate normal food like collards and grits and right, all right, this. Right. And, and it was their way of kind of um, you know overcoming their sense of being uh, southern frauds in a, a, a Yankee environment. Right. So, yeah. Right. And um, and that was where I was really introduced to this kind of passionate, heartfelt connection to Jesus Christ which has endured through through all of these trials and tribulations and triumphs and failures and right you know this uh, connection with Jesus never never left me um, and so that was the great gift of that tradition to me um, you know the that kind of um, inspirational emotional connection to a to a and you a, felt the connection absolutely yeah the, and people will say I, I never feel a connection there you know that was it's not all, me. It's all fairy tale stuff. That was not me. I, I would look up at the sky when I was four and knew that something out there loved me and made me and never would let go of me. That was a, you know, a consistent experience of presence you know, all these years, and it's even more intense today. <laughs> so, I, you know, so after, you, after you get knocked down to your knees. Uh, so, that's, you know, uh, it, that's what that's happens. Fun. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but, I, yeah. I, I went through life after, you know, being abused and raped. And, uh, I, you know, back then, the Episcopal, I grew up in an Episcopal church. Right. And, and back then, the minister was like, God is a sovereign God. <laughs> You know, you do good, good things will happen to you. You step Correct. out of line, you incur God's wrath. So, right. so at 12 years old, when I'm having an animal rape me, you know, I'm like, what the heck could I have done to incur <laughs> God's wrath that this is happening? Yep. And I'm like, screw this God stuff. Right. It, it served me no purpose. Absolutely. I can, and, I can see that. And, and that's what abuse does. It's a soul killer. Right. Because at that young age... That's how, you know, you see God as this, you know, like, but, but then we're making God out to be a superhero. So like the train's ready to derail and God stops it from derailing. Right. And the car crash, God stops the car crash or, or the, the tsunami and God makes the wave calm down. That's, that's what we're looking. People will be like, when they hear my story, they're like, well, that's just proof that there is no God. Right. That, but then, so. We're, we're taking free will out of the equation exactly. and making God a superhero to stop all these events from ever happening. Exactly. And, and then why even exist? <laughs> right. You know, <laughs> we're just little puppets on the string. Our decisions become irrelevant. Right. 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 And, and it took me, it took me till being arrested to a pastor that explained that to me. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then it just like, it just, I was able to start praying again. Like right. I couldn't pray. I couldn't even close my eyes without seeing violence or sex or whatever. And, ah. uh, and then once he explained the whole free will thing to me, I was like, 
I, I wish they had told me that earlier. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, exactly. So I didn't think God was in charge of every single little thing. Yeah, you know? but yeah. yeah. That's and that's how I think how a lot of people view God. You know, like as this superhero that should step in and save the day. Uh, yeah, and if I were God, I would probably be inclined to do such a thing. Right. But I'm just working with the assumption that God is more intelligent than I am. <laughs> right, 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 right. And that's proven. <laughs> Minute by minute. <laughs> so, so uh, you go off to Oxford. I do. And, and what are you studying when you theology? You you did. Yeah, exactly. Okay, exactly. And um, for various reasons, I couldn't really see myself in the Southern Baptist minister role, and um, and I was introduced to this different way of doing Jesus and church, and that seemed to fit perfectly, and. Um, you know, because number one, uh, they didn't have a problem with drinking, and I thought that was fantastic. Ah, uh-huh, we're onto something here. <laughs> we are onto a religion that do, you know that that sort of, in some ways, is quite comfortable with the vicar um, imbibing in beer and wine, et cetera. Um, I think I can do this. Thing this here. is the one for me. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I picked the perfect career. Exactly, and um, you know, and uh, my my life has been a, a convergence of many of these themes: the Jesus theme, and the um, you know the addiction theme, and the recovery theme, all coming together and blending and beautiful. Constantly getting knocked down to your knees. Absolutely, and back up it's so and great. Down again. It's so awesome. Uh, so, right. so what? So, how long does it take to become a priest? What do you have to do after you get? Well, through Oxford? I I went uh, to that Oxford four University. Is that four years? I, I was going to stay on there, but then I lost the funding uh, through a decision by Margaret Thatcher's government. But uh, okay. uh, and uh, so I came back to the United States and then enrolled in Yale Divinity School, and that's where I ended up graduating. And uh, when I graduated, I had the support of the Diocese of Connecticut to pursue this vocation so okay um and then and then where'd you go oh, well, from there after you got your degree okay so i got i get my degree and i began my my priesthood ministry in all saints in millington new jersey okay and it's my ordained ministry has been in new jersey the entire time how why'd you pick new jersey uh well i was uh, down uh at uh, drew university for a bit of this and uh my first wife was um was uh, whoa 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 you don't you don't get to just throw that in and keep going on <laughs> this is unbelievable there today. is there's a lot going on let me tell you I, I i i maybe my headphones are messed up but it sounded like you said first wife i did yes right <laughs> Isn't that like one of the big no-nos? Uh, well, it's it's possible to be uh, divorced and remarried in the Episcopal Church, even for priests and bishops and members. And you took full uh, advantage of that. Well, uh, you know, <laughs> not to be a buzzkill, but she actually died of, of uh, oh. a kind of cancer. So, so yeah. Oh, so just, I have... just make me feel like a fool right now. <laughs> Thanks for that. <laughs> Um, you know, so that uh, ended my marital obligation at that time. <laughs> um, and I was uh, sober at that time. Really? Um, okay. Yes, I was. Um, but uh, what, what age are we talking here? Uh, this is uh, in my 30s. And um, but um, nothing like a good, um, uh, you know, kind of tragedy like that, a painful, agonizing period uh, to use as a, a reason to start drinking again. You know, so <laughs> what had stopped you from when did you how long had you not drank and, um, why, and why? It was for about four years. And I had uh, just kind of witnessed the way that it was increasing and kind of went, huh, look at that. Is this why you were in school still? Uh, or no, after your no, I, first I was on, job? on to my second priest job. Okay. And um, I thought, wow, that, you know, um, six months ago, I wasn't drinking that much. Um, almost like a, a kind of an objective, removed observer of oneself. You right. Know? You know, and now I'm stopping off at the liquor store before I go home. What's what's up with that? And, so you're able to do this self analysis. Uh, uh, yeah. And, well, it, it hadn't gotten quite so serious at that point. Right. Right. <laughs> you know, and um, you know, so I was like, all right, well, this has got to this has got to stop. So you stopped. And I did. Yes. Right. And I um, you just know, on I, your own. I had no. I went. I, I tried to stop on my own, and I, I realized that I couldn't. So really? I uh, I was not um, medically or chemically addicted, physically addicted to alcohol at that time, uh, but I just kept going back to it. And I, so I did, um, you know, get some some help and went to a few meetings, and um, 
you know, I went to special meetings because I'm a special guy. Hmm. I went to priest meetings. Really? And all the professionals uh, sort of suggested that I not do that, that, um, you know, uh, special alcoholics don't recover too well. Uh, but I didn't listen. I knew better. And I went to my priest meeting and... Um, you know, and even and, and, and what's a priest meeting? This explain, is a, it's explain a, a, a little more. It's let a, us inside the it's secret a re, society. A here. recovery meeting for a, a priest with a, sub, a priest with a substance abuse problem. Okay, uh, certain professions have them. Um, you know, airline pilots have meetings, and police and surgeons, and you right. know, because it's kind of um, difficult professionally for a surgeon, for instance, to <laughs> announce at a at a recovery meeting that they. <laughs> I think that would be a career killer. Uh, uh, might be, <laughs> might be. So they have their own ways to recover, right, and, right. and that's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Yeah. Um, but what, when I was in that sort of special status, um, I was less open to the suggestions of others. You know, like I know better. I'm smart. I got this. I, you know, like I'm disciplined. Uh, I'm strong. And um, and that would very much was not the case with addictive illness. Right, right, right. <laughs> yeah. You know, so, so you know, it's um, it's a it's a disease. You know that I uh, look at every day, particularly in my work and in my uh, you know participation, sponsoring other people in recovery, um, of minimization more than denial. From my observation, that we think it's oh, it's this little cuddly ball that I play with my addiction and and it's not it's gigantic you know right like, and over time that became very apparent to me <laughs> yeah I, this I, was had, huge. Uh, I had you know one of my biker friends after i got out of prison uh say to me you know uh, now that all your 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 molestation is out in the open and your healing and your pains out there for the world to see don't you think you could have a couple beers yeah. with us right <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, I very well possibly could. Yeah. Or those couple beers will lead to a glass of red wine. And when I have red wine, a line of cocaine goes perfect with I, red wine. And then I'm off to the races. I this guess. is this is an alcoholic mind at work. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know, the reason that you started using these substances is no longer sort of presenting itself. No longer so empowering, you know, like powerful over you. So I should. Be so able you should to. be able to do that. But meanwhile, addiction has taken on a life of itself. Right. So its origin almost doesn't matter at that point. That 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 was my experience, you know. So yeah. you know, oh, if I get do enough therapy and and overcome the the childhood, you know, issues that I had, then uh, an occasional like you know. A glass of wine should be fine. Right. I recognize that as the voice of my- I have to my... do communion for crying out <laughs> yeah. loud. What's, yeah. what, what? That's, a, that's a different story entirely. But uh, yeah, so uh, you know that doesn't work because uh, addiction is powerful and it's big and it takes people down. Just, uh -huh. I, I want to bring up one other thing. Just, I know what you'll, you'll end up saying, but you know, I- a, a lot of, a lot of people nowadays uh, with depression or anxiety- right. Are are using microdosing, you know, uh, mushrooms, MDMA, which is uh, you know, uh, the party drug. Right. Uh, there's that the uh, the drug down in the rainforest, ayahuasca. Yeah. A and you know, I from what I've read, fifty percent of the people are cured of their depression who have who have used it. A and my thing that I say about it is. If you had an addiction history, uh, do you want to wake up the sleeping giant within? Exactly. Even though you're microdosing, you're feeling something, and then your body says, "Hey, wait a second! I remember that feeling." That's right. <laughs> it's it's on a smaller level right now. Let's take it to the big level. <laughs> Let's and, go. And, right. and that's what I'm afraid. Like, so I I would never do it. Yeah. But somebody who didn't have an addiction history and they can do it and and cure themselves fine. But what's your what have you? encountered you know that scenario of somebody uh, doing that you know i have found in in being alive for a while that um offering suggestions to people who aren't aren't asking for it uh doesn't work so well but when people do ask me and they do um you know uh, at my work and in my recovery uh community um you know uh my therapist was maybe suggesting this should should i do it and i would say something like well, this is what it would do to me. So now is March. Say that I set something up like this for March 8th and I do it under a doctor's care. 
Um, in November, I'm going to be on a flight. The likelihood that I'm going to be upgraded is high. <laughs> I'll be in first class. They'll come by with the tray of what I would really want. <laughs> right. And I would think in, somewhere back in my alcoholic brain would go, well, you relapsed on March 8th anyway. <laughs> you, know, you know, so the line has been crossed right. already, you know. Right, right. You know, you haven't been fully sober this whole time because of that. Right. You know, that sort of introduction of, you know, hallucinogens. Right. And um and so for that reason I would definitely say no. <laughs> and if anybody asks me, I would recommend that they say no as well. Right. Because this thing is so slippery yeah. and it's so easy for you to slide into it again. I think of Matthew Perry from the show Friends. Exactly. All right. So he's doing under a doctor's care ketamine yeah. treatments, microdosing <laughs> ketamine. But then something must have triggered in him. And on the outside, he's doing mass amounts of ketamine. Right. And exactly. that's, uh, 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 that's the whole thing. Something, that little microdose of ketamine woke up the, the giant of addiction back in him. And, well, why should I not feel, like, feel better all the time? Yep. And then he's off to the races and ends up dying. And there are other ways to, to find that sense that we long for as addicted people, actually as human people. <laughs> you know, I mean, everybody's got a sense of missing something, you right. know. Right. And, uh, and for us, because of our history, uh, for, a, for a period of time, drugs and alcohol really, really hit the spot. Served a purpose. It right. just gave me that, ah, I can cope kind of feeling. Right. You know? Until it stopped working. Right. And at that point, it was too late for me to stop on my own. And it had already started to sort of consume my life and the lives of people that, that cared for me. All right. So you're, you're probably talking about your second go in. So you, you, you go to your little uh, secret society priest meetings. Yeah, that's and, right. And it gives you enough jump start to get sober back then. Right. Now your first wife dies. And, and, and do we reach for a drink immediately after that or what what was you know there's a some, take me through the progression some period of time where i i'm not grabbing a drink but then i end up with one and kind of the worst possible scenario happened where i had one drink and nothing happened and i think well <clears throat> i've overcome this i'm fine now and then a a, a month later uh, you'll be shocked uh, another one ends up in my hand and then about six months after that, I'm drinking more than I ever did. You know, that it comes roaring back. And then you tenfold know, more than... The, the sleeping beast has awakened, you know. <laughs> and, um, you know, and it, it starts to grow and get larger and get more all-consuming. And now, are you still single at this point? Or you, I, I know you got married again, so I where did. are we? I did. I got... Your... Yeah, that's, you know, it's sort of like... How did you meet your second wife? Uh, I met her in church. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. right. Yeah. And she met me as a, you know, a person um, who was... You know, managing alcohol at the time. So you weren't sober when you met her? Uh, not entirely, no. All right. So yeah. this is after the first wife had died. You're right. Having right. a drink. Yeah. And, but there, it, and you meet your second wife. Right. And then I'm kind of trying mm. to stop for a period of time, you know, that in that kind of awful state of uh, trying to control the uncontrollable. You know, and, and, uh, and did you have any of the anger issues that your father and grandfather, when you drank, were you a happy little drunk or were you, did um, you have a little anger side to you? I, I, I could. Uh, I was not, uh, thanks be to God, violent. Right. And um, so when we had children and all that, they, that, that piece was broken and, um, and has not returned. Thanks be to God. So. Okay. Um, and uh, but you know, I could be unpleasant, and I could moody. Uh, moody. Yes, yeah. absolutely. You know, how, how far into the marriage are we? You know, is it you're drinking when you meet her? So everything, you know, is she a drinker? Uh, she's not. No. Never, no. No. Even no. Back she's when you met her? Um, she's what I would call chronically normal. So she <laughs> is what I described in the beginning. Yeah, that's, <laughs> right. that's right. Yeah. She had an excellent Maybe upbringing. Maybe she should have became the priest. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, no, she um, handles things normally. She lets go of resentments like uh, quite easily and is agreeable. She's not moody at all. She's right. very consistent, like all the time. Very loving and you know, a wonderful wife and a wonderful mother of my kids. Right. <laughs> right. 
And is is she like as as the marriage is going on and your drinking's increasing, is she confronting you? Is she, she like, is. what is going on here? She is, and it's becoming more and uh, you know, powerful and more, you know, in control of me. Um, so my most sort of cringeworthy uh, remembrances are my drunken denials of drinking to her. Right. Uh, I'm not drinking. <laughs> that's right. How dare you? Right. How dare you challenge? You know, I'm I, I'm just trying to be a, a, a loving dad and and priest and uh, I'm under you know, a lot of pressure, bro. That is correct. You know, <laughs> and uh, you know, if you would just leave me alone, I'll be fine. Right. You know, so I, I'm denying it. I'm protecting this this sort of like parasite that has latched onto me because on the inside it feels like if I take the parasite away, I will not survive. You know, that's I I, I would never have that thought, but that's what it feels like for me to be an alcoholic in my active addiction. That I, I can't. Is the I'm, parasite you're talking about your pain, or is the parasite your addiction? Addiction. Okay. Addiction, and it feeds off of pain. It loves pain because right. I, you know, I understand you better than anybody. Alcohol says to me, right? <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, right. And I would, I would do these heroic efforts. I would stop for a few weeks. I would stop for a month. You know, and um, and when when, uh, you know, it became unbearable being me. Without this thing, um, and I, I picked it up again. The, and then the, every the, time you pick it up, it comes it, roaring the, back. The sense of it is, and this is what's so hard for normal people to understand us. Right. You know? The sense was like, "Oh, baby, where you been? <laughs> you know, I've missed you so much. Right. You know, nobody gets you like I do. Right. You know. Right. And there's this sense of, you know, like." of extreme euphoria. It's a spiritual experience yeah. of being united to the, with the universe, you know, and able to kind of, um, you know, the word ecstasy in Greek, ekstaeo, it means literally to stand outside yourself. You know, like what a joyful kind of thing for somebody with a trauma profile to get outside of my own skin. Right. You know, to be freed from the, <clears throat> the agony of being me. You know, that's hard to compete with, you know, uh, when people are going, well, why don't you just think positive thoughts or whatever, you know, or just say no to the alcohol. It's, it's insinuated itself at a, at a very kind of core spiritual level. And what I was seeking from it was a spiritual solution to my life. I really was. And I, uh, I never stopped praying and I never stopped functioning, although, you know, under the influence um, as, as a priest. Um, Did you do any services half shit it up? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> to put it mildly, uh, towards the end, it was um, I could not function without without alcohol in me. W would you feel like I need a couple bracers to, before I get up in front of everybody? If I didn't, I would be shaking right. and sweating. Right, so, so, um, so, it's, so that question answers itself, right? So, um, so your your alcoholism is that to that point. If you don't have it, you're you're, you're absolutely you're absolutely. going into the tremors. And, I I sponsor yeah. uh, a number of people who have like a heroin or opiate um, a background addiction right. issues, and they talk about being dope sick. And and I know what that is from alcohol. Maybe not to the degree, maybe you know, like. Um, but I, I know what it's like to to uh, be in full blown withdrawals and being unable to function at all. Right. You know that was what it was like at the end, and uh, and absolutely hating myself. Yeah. For um, how this had happened, and how uh, profoundly I had. Um, let people down in my church and in my family. Uh, when I when I first, uh, you know, I never read the Bible until I was locked up. And when I first read Romans chapter seven, and Paul's like, yeah. "I hate what I do. The <laughs> things I want to do, I cannot do. No. I keep doing the thing I hate." Stop everything like, I don't. Want to. I know what that I'm is. Like, yeah. Yes. I'm yeah. like, he nailed it. He nailed my that addiction. That is it. That is you it know? exactly. And. Um, and, you know, and I would get together these, like I said, a week or whatever, you know, shaking, sick. And then I would 
and it, and I just felt so crushed by it. And I, I would inevitably come to the conclusion, if this is what sober is, I can't do it. It's too hard. It's too right. painful, um, you know, because I had no coping mechanisms. The alcohol had hijacked them all. Yeah, right. You same know, for, and the brain's, brain's very efficient. The brain goes, oh, I see you're not using these self-soothing tissues. We'll appropriate them over here for another, another use. <laughs> you know, so then you stop and it's just like red alert. You know, right. how am I supposed to deal with anything? And I was pretty cranky for when I finally got sober in 2008. Um, um, you know, I was pretty cranky for a long period of time. <laughs> so, like, is, is, all right, so you, you're drinking this to the point, you know, where you got tremors and you're sweating. Absolutely. And, and you quit here and there. And you're just like, I, you know, this sober thing's not for me. I can't do it. Yeah. What's going on in, in the home life? Is your wife, you know, like, Rob? What the hell, bro? <laughs> yeah, ex exactly. Exactly. I mean, she's, you know, she, thank thank God she sort of sought outside help and was kind of doing some kind of Al Anon type, Al -Anon of, stuff. type yeah. of stuff. So she sort of backed off and said, all right, whatever, you know, but it was getting frightening. Um, and uh, my kids were two and four when I got sober. Wow. Oh, you right. know, she married a real beauty here, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Is she, did she ever give you an ultimatum? Um, you know, those it, are discouraged. Uh, and, you know, but it was pretty clear that I was on very thin ice. Right. And, um, and of course, you know, so, uh, so again, this is the way it would work. Um, you know, the signs of how, how absolutely dysfunctional this all is were, were, were sort of piling up and the evidence was mounting. Um, and then I, I would get to, the, to this like temporary sweet spot of intoxication and I would go, oh, they love me. You know, they think I'm funny. You know, this, this way that it justifies itself, right. you know, like, um, you know, uh, they, they all are on my side, you know, and, and, and then I would come to my senses and realize just how absolutely untenable this whole thing was and how it just was getting worse and worse and worse. And, and, and finally, you know, the whole system of family and church just couldn't take it. Any, they couldn't watch me die. And so they sort of intervened. And uh, yeah, I mean, when I was using and, you know, at my height, yeah. I thought I had everybody full. I thought I was like, uh, you know, I'm mixing cocaine with, with heroin and right. pain pills and Xanax and bottles of vodka. And I'm like, man, I got this balance perfect. Yeah. Like, it is. That's right. Nobody knows a thing. And I'm, I'm charming, too. Yes, I'm. <laughs> I'm Fun to be around. <laughs> Meanwhile, everybody's talking. What the hell is going on with Clark? <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. They're all ter you know, and um, you know, and, and I thought that primarily they were when I got sober. I thought that they were ashamed because I was deeply ashamed. But they that wasn't it. They were scared because and they felt helpless. They didn't know what to do. And um, and that was their experience. They were they were sad, scared, and helpless. And who's they? Uh, church and family, you know. Um, and it was different than I had thought. So you think you're like pulling it off, and you're just happy go lucky, a funny guy. And meanwhile, everybody's like, this guy's train is going off the tracks. That's How right. How do we get him? That's right. People who come from a sacramental tradition like ours might be able to kind of understand this, but, um, you know, I, I don't know if you can imagine what it's like to give the most holy sacrament of the altar to a woman who's been in the church for decades and thinks the world of me, and I can't stop shaking, and my hand is shaking as I'm reaching down to her and saying, the body of Christ, and, and I see her see it. Right. And I can't deny it. She knows that I'm shaking, and she knows why. And I'm absolutely hating myself, mm. you know. And I I want to die because I'm I'm like I'm disappointing her so much. And she and she loves the church and loves me. And and it's like, what's up with this? Right. Um. And wow. It's just devastating that's you know? powerful like, yeah holy spirit that's a that's you know. a I'm, I'm picturing that scene yeah and, uh, man right right i mean <laughs> for myself i had that exact moment but in quick check yeah <laughs> <laughs> right. 
Right. I am all jammed up on Coke <laughs> and I go to pay for something and I'm like, I'm, I'm like, I'm like holding my wrist with right. My, like, right. to give her the money because I can't like, because I'm so jammed up. That's right. You realize that you're not pulling it off. Right. And, and it's just, it's breathtaking and frightening, you know, um, you know, particularly to someone with, uh, understandable professional expectations. You know, people look at a priest and they don't expect you to be drunk all the time. Right. You know, was, you're still not allowed to do that. They're, they're <laughs> supposed to be the drunk coming to you. That's it. Exactly. You got the role reversed. Well, that's it. Exactly. And um, and it's that it, you're you're right onto it. That that way in which uh, I'm supposed to be the one helping them, and I got nothing, nothing for myself. I am just spiritually bankrupt as our tradition speaks of, right. you know, there's just, there's not, you know, and, and I haven't stopped praying, but it's not, it's not touching this place. I had sealed it off and sort of said, all right, God, let's talk today, but not about this, not about the booze, not right. about this. That's, that's hands off. You know, you just do your, uh, you know, uh, you know, thank you for another day. Uh, Watch yeah. over my family yeah. and, and friends and you know, right. Blah, 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 and blah, blah. I would, you know, pray for people in the parish and all that kind of stuff. And um, but but finally, it just got too much. And the uh, people at church sort of confronted me, and they, um, you know, and I had tried various ways to quit drinking. None of them were sustainable. None of them worked because I didn't. You know, again, I was I was special. I was doing the Robert program, the Robert method of, you know, uh, dictating the term, saying, all right, I'm going to do this and not that. And um, then you, you I, I, this is a while back you had told me this, um, but didn't you go to like a hot dog hut where like a Muslim guy worked or something? Uh, uh, it was a sizzling kebab. There were, there were Turkish guys. And, uh, right. And they, they realized that I was under the influence at a time, it was on a Saturday morning. I remember it so distinctly. Um, where I felt fine. And they go, whoa, when did you start? And I was like, damn. Wow. If, if they're seeing it, right. <laughs> you know, you know then I can't possibly be getting away with this in, in my church. What's my congregation and my What's family a, yeah, saying? No, 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 right. You're, you're deluding yourself. But, you know, um, you, uh, that's, what, that's what active alcoholism will enable you to do, delude yourself. Until you can't, right. or until somebody goes, uh, dude, you know you're not getting away with this, <laughs> you, know? you know, and and that was the conversation that brought me. So your on congregation, my way to... some members of the congregation, what after a service one day, or uh, well, it was an actual, you know, in the office kind of thing. Like, um, when are you going to do something about your drinking? Okay, and of course, um, I came up with you have to get defiant. Um, you know, I or, I, or, or were you at a point where you were like, I was beaten down uh, sufficient right. again, you know, it's such an act of grace that that was the case. Um, you know, I've worked with clergy, uh, since then I've been sober since 2008. It's an amazing thing, um, uh, who get defiant, go, what are you talking about? And all that. And that generally does not go well, <laughs> you right. know, but again, I was in such a state of pain and self-loathing that. Um, but I still, you know, me and, and, you know, as I colluded with my addiction and, and, you know, surrendered to my addiction, I wanted to do it my way. And I said, all right, here's what we're going to do. <laughs> You're saying this to the congregation? Oh, no, right. well, to the, you know, the leadership. Right. There was a place down, it's, it's still there, Princeton House in, um, in Princeton. And, and being a kind of a, you know, snotty uh, academic sort, I thought, oh, that sounds perfect for me. Um, turns out the Princeton house is uh, filled with uh, heroin addicts from Camden. Uh, so it's not for the elite, which was my hope. Right. But they had started a program for uh, professionals. And I like that. that. That really kind of, you know, stroked my ego. Oh, professionals. That's, you know, what's more white collar than me, you know? Right. <laughs> And so, you know, so I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down there and, um, and I love the name of it. It was called The Retreat. So I, I, I told the leadership, oh, what I want you to do is, to, is I'm, I'm going to go away and you tell the congregation that Father is suffering from exhaustion, like one of the celebrities. Right. You know? Anything but the truth, of course, you know, and, um, and. And tell them that I'm on retreat, and that's the name of the place, so you won't be lying, you know. 
And they were skeptical because, you know, they had seen me in action. Right. <laughs> and they thought, well, maybe, maybe that's not what we're going to do. And that's not what we ended up doing. They said, okay, well, if you can stay sober before you go down to the retreat, then maybe we'll go that route. And they came in the next day and I was drunk at my desk. Wow. And they said, no, we're not doing that. And so I was carted off to a treatment center in Pennsylvania. And as I was being driven there by a very, very gracious church leader, um, I said, well, what are you going to do on Sunday? And he said, we're going to stand in front of the congregation and tell them that our priest is away getting treatment for his alcoholism. Oh, boy. You can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that a HIPAA violation or something? <laughs> you know? And I was just, I was so uncomfortable with the idea that my absolute failure would be paraded out in front of these people. Right. And, and, and it, it tapped into all those childhood fears. You know, if you really knew me, you would hate me and you would leave. You know, that was what I thought would have happened. Um, that, that if they knew the truth about me and just how shattered I was, and, and, and what a fraud I was in a sense of presenting, you know, as the guy that has it together, right. um, then, then I would be done. You know, the wall was coming down, the one I'd carefully constructed of a guy that, that, that had it all together. And I very conspicuously did not have it all together. <laughs> you know, I was on display to everyone. And they had the wisdom to follow Jesus who said, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free," he says. <laughs> you, know, you know the tr You know, and I, I was very suspicious that that would work. And I said, "Okay, all right. Well, I can deal with that, but just please don't tell the bishop." I was afraid of getting fired. And they go, "Oh no, no, the bishop's all involved in this." I'm like, "Oh, God. Ah! <laughs> you know, you know." You know. <laughs> The sense of, you know, absolute exposure, you know, <laughs> you know, the worst case scenario, that's what this was. You know? uh, yeah. And, um, you know, and, and so I, 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 I go out there and I had a, um, a really special moment where, where it all tipped. It was a, it was my recovery came in a moment where the, um, the pain of the addiction and the desire to get sober just sort of just went blunk and, and. And it went from one, you know, like, okay, I guess I want to be sober, but I don't know, to like, I got to get this. I got to have this. And it was, I was there in um, November of 2008, and I was on the relapse unit for those who had tried to be sober many times like I had, people that had gotten other treatment and failed. So I was on the relapse unit in this very large treatment center. And we were given a challenge by the organizers of the of the rehab to uh, decorate our lounge for the holidays, and they gave us nothing to work with. And so, you know, we threw ourselves completely into this because we were like the losers of the rehab. You know, we were relapse, and um, including you know the um, you know we're getting foil out of the garbage, and making ornaments and. And I snuck out one night and stole the Christmas lights on the uh, front of the rehab that were around the bushes to bring in and, and put into our lounge. And um, I mean, think about that for a moment. You know, I'm a priest on the relapse unit of an alcohol treatment center stealing Christmas lights. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you sounds know. perfectly normal to me. <laughs> you know, I mean, like uh, there's something wrong here. You know. And um, so we decorated our lounge. It looked spectacular. It was, it was just absolutely gorgeous. But when the judges were going to come by right before dinner um, to see which lounge was decorated the best in a competition, uh, we started to get nervous. So we sent a scout out to check out the other lounges. And, um, and they went out to Intermediate and uh, came back and said, I don't know if we're going to win this. Intermediate's got it going on. And I'm in that brittle stage of being like sober for like two weeks. And I'm just like, Ugh. what do they got to compete with this glory that we've created here? Well, what they had was this, um, this guy who smoked his cocaine from Philadelphia. And his name was uh, David or Dave. And he, he looked like a jockey. He was like four foot 11 and weighed like 85 pounds. And they had 
they had taken his clothes off and take and gotten a sheet. Well, the way the scout put it, he goes, I don't know, man. Intermediate's got it going on. And they um <laughs> I said, What do they got? And they said, they got crackhead Dave dressed up like the baby Jesus in the manger. <laughs> you, know, <laughs> you know, they had they had made swaddling clothes for crackhead Dave and made a and made a manger out of a cardboard box and placed him delicately in the manger. He was the baby Jesus, you know. And and I saw no humor in that whatsoever, <laughs> you know. And it was in that moment where I said, what? What has happened to my life? You know, I'm the priest of a prominent parish. I went to to Yale and Oxford. <laughs> why do I know a guy named Crackhead Dave? <laughs> <laughs> why, why is he being baby Jesus? And why is he in my life? You know, <laughs> you, know? you know, and that was the moment. You know, I said, I've got to, I've got to throw my entire self into this. You know, and, and I did. And I did. You know, I, I, I said, whatever they tell me to do, I will do. That was the moment. It was. It was. It was like, this has got to stop. You know, I, I, I've thought that I had this. I in no way have this. I need help from other people. You know, mm -hmm. you know and, and that was and, your surrender moment. It was. Absolutely. It was my moment of clarity and that and that and that movement of of letting go of I know I'm smart I knew nothing uh, and I and I knew I knew nothing um and I I decided to trust people in recovery especially I had done tried to do the psychiatric route and all that kind of stuff what I needed was people like me who um who could laugh about crackhead Dave stories <laughs> you know who who could kind of get the shenanigans that accompanies this disease um, and who could tell me what to do. You know, we'll see you tomorrow night, right? Yes. Somehow I was given the grace to say yes to what they recommended. I didn't like a lot of it, but I suspended for a moment my hypercritical, judgmental. I thought their spirituality was was really unformed, and I had lots of recommendations how a, uh, my recovery community could re improve their spirituality. They were reluctant to embrace my uh, wisdom. Go figure. You know, <laughs> <laughs> you know six weeks sober. You right. Know? <laughs> you know, so that was that was the tipping point. That's when it changed. And the the next big one was when I came back to my parish, and. Um, and so what did, how long you did a 30 day? I did a 30 longer? day. That's okay. right. Exactly. And, and I came back and I, uh, again, it, for me, it was the worst case scenario. Every single person knew where you were, where I was what and what had happened to me. And now I was back. And so the veil is removed. That's right. And so I get into the procession, <laughs> you know, to go into the church and I'm singing the hymn, going to my magnificent throne. And I'm thinking, everybody knows, everybody knows, everybody knows, everybody. It would have been easier to do that mass naked. It really would have been, you know, you know to be sort of fully exposed. Right. Yeah. And there was a point in the... Vulnerable. Oh, and completely. And addicts hate vulnerability. Yeah, absolutely. And there was a point in the service where they just erupted in applause. And, and I had no expectation of anything like that. I thought the opposite would take place. I felt like I was transported transported to some sort of alien planet or culture that I knew nothing of, and I had been. Um, it was the land of grace, you know, where um, I love the old creaky theological definition. Grace is God's unmerited favor, neither earned nor deserved. It's just given. It's on the house. <laughs> yep. Here, you know, well, I'm not worthy. I, yeah, I know that. Here you go anyway. You know, <laughs> you know that's the, that's the experience. They're applauding. Right. You know, the, um, this, this major disaster, <laughs> you know, of my life, it was, it was magic. Amazing. It, it absolutely was. And Did I, you break down? 
uh, yeah, it was too much, I you know. I imagine and, it would be so emotional for that to happen. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm, uh, I'm, you know, and, and there's been so many of those. Uh, now I just organize my day around, um, you know, anticipating grace, experiencing grace. You know, I'm driving here to talk to you, and I, I love you, and we connect, we've connected many times over the years. And uh, you really touch my soul and inspire me. And I'm going, oh, this is this is going to be great, you know. And the next thing I do, I'm looking for the same thing. I've got like I'm like a heat-seeking mi- missile. The same way I looked for um, liquor stores, I now look for the grace movement in people's lives. And I see it all the time in the church. You know, I've got this incredible life of like two vocations: of vocation of the priesthood and vocation and recovery. And it's a- it's got to help you. Uh- to deal with people like, cause now you're not exalted way up here yeah. when, when someone like me, who's killed someone right. or the heroin addict or the alcoholic and you're down at our level. Right. And, you know, and, and now you have the compassion because you've been at that level. Right. Yeah. It's out, the cat's out of the bag. What am I going to pretend? Right. <laughs> you know, you know. Yeah, you know, and I, I just want to, you know, while we're here before, you know, this ends, you know, so how I met you, uh, my mother had gone to your church and and she's coming to visit me on Sundays and she sees you walk out of the jail and you give her a hug. And this one time you grabbed her by the shoulders And you said, I want you and your son to start praying on the number five is in a five year sentence. And, and now I know you say it wasn't from divine intervention, but you said it was from like one of the senior lieutenants or something who said that Frederick's guy, they ought to start praying for a five or something. (laughs) Right. Is that, that, that it was, it was even more wonderful than that. It was a, uh, an inmate uh, who had been uh, with you in the jail. Who, and that's uh, who you went to see? Uh, he, no, he had ended up at an AA meeting in, in my church. Okay. And we were talking about you. And he said, that guy's going to do five years. And this guy was, uh, uh, you know, the neck tat, uh, you know, the whole, the whole right. bit, you know, <laughs> he looked the part. I ah, see. I never knew that. <laughs> yep. I thought it was from one that of was the, the back. That was the backstory. And he said, five. so I said to your mother, um, I think he's going to do five years from what I hear. And, uh, and she goes, really? And I said, well, let's pray for that. <laughs> but it was a guy, and um, I don't think he, it, it, from what I know, his um, his sobriety was not sustained. But right. I'll, I'll leave it at that. So. <laughs> so my mother comes into the jail that yeah. day, and she's like, I just saw Father Griner, you know, who, who's, you know, the head of the Christ Church I go to. And uh, he says we should pray on the number five. And I do the Macaulay Culkin thing, like, you know, (laughs) oh, mom. I'm like, a five is not going to (laughs) happen. You got to pick a number that's a little more realistic. I was thinking 20. That's that's what I had in my head, you know? Me too. Me too. She came in and said, let's do a 20. All right. (laughs) And and, and she tells me, I believe in God. I believe in miracles. And I want you to start believing. Yeah. You know, and I'm like, all right. There we are. So from that point forward. I start praying on a five. I meditate on a five. Right. A- and lo and behold, I go for sentencing. I get a five. All right. <laughs> now, I come, I come. You were at, you were at a lot of my uh, court hearings supporting my mother. Right. And so I go to her church to meet you, to thank you for, you know, the five <laughs> and, and to thank you for supporting my mother. And you're like, Hey, can you come in during the week for, for a private visit? You know, I just want to talk to you. I'm like, sure. So we walk into your office. I don't even know if you remember this, but you, you shut your, your doors mm-hmm. and you turn to me and I backhand you on your shoulder and you're like, what was that for? <laughs> Yeah, right. And I go, you couldn't tell my mother to pray for a three? I would have been out already. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. Right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And we had a good chuckle. And, uh, yeah. and then that good. started, uh, you know, that's how I met you. Yeah. yeah. Backhanding you is how I met you. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. So, yeah, right. But I just want, I thought the audience would love that story. I never knew it was from an inmate who said that. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's uh, amazing. It's even more of a, of a kind of an interesting, you know, so, so I, I, I was, um, you know, Mostly under the influence for about five years of my church, 
Um, and so I, I figured I owed him at least that. And I, I gave him um, another uh, 13 of sober. Right. And, um, you know, and so I'm, I'm at my kind of retirement, you know, my departure dinner. And, um, uh, and I say to them, I don't know. I think that God has done more with my disasters than God has done with my successes or my scary talent or my incredible brain. Uh, that's and, how I um, feel. Exactly. Uh, and, that's, and that's what I said to them. And there was something within me um, that wanted them to argue, but they didn't. <laughs> they said, yep, yep, yep. We concur. Yeah, right, exactly. Because the the my experience was, again, one of grace. They... Um, when they, they knew the truth about me and they did not leave. In fact, the parish just took off and recovery people started coming. They go, you know, can I go to your church? I'm like, yeah, I'm not promoting your, <laughs> you know, you becoming a member there just because we know each other. But yeah, anybody can go, <laughs> you know, and, and it became a home for people. We went from one AA meeting a week to like seven before COVID, I think. And, um, and there was this sense of, of freedom about talking about it in my church and the sense of pride on their part. Yeah, we have a priest who had a problem and and he overcame. You know? Yeah, I love like I, I went in and uh, you you talked openly about it. And I was right. like, I can relate to this dude. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and and it's all over uh, you know, <laughs> I have two big books. I have the blue one of Alcoholics Anonymous and I have the the black one sure. of Holy Scripture, you know. And and you know, St. Paul says says that God's power is made perfect in, in our weakness, you know, not in our strength, but in our weakness. It like, it like God looks at us and goes, oh, I can use that. You know, when I was all like, oh, self-sufficient and relying on my own strength and my own power, you know, then God's like, yeah, well, all right, go ahead and do your thing. You know, <laughs> you know but, but, you know, God's power is made perfect in weakness. It's our story, isn't it? You know, the, Saved by grace, and none of you can boast. Uh, that's right. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, precisely. Yeah. So um, you know, that's been uh, you know, it's opened up everything. And and I have to tell you honestly, um, yeah. And unless it seems like boasting, it was just really a product of getting out of my own way and following this path, the Jesus path and the recovery path. Um, I have a sense of of like persistent joy in my life now that I didn't think was reasonable for a human being to experience, you know, and it's, and it's been there since, since I got sober, it has not left. <laughs> you know? And, you know, and things have not gone my way and there's been some losses and pain and all that, but that has not, you know, this profound sense of just being okay. You know, the thing I wanted so much when I was little, the thing I would get glimpses of, you know, looking at the stars when I was five and the grass in Atlanta, you know, looking up and going, wow, you know, um, that's implanted there. I love being sober. It is the best thing that's ever happened to me. And I love to try to, you know, give this to other people and help them have those crackhead Dave moments where the thing shifts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, you know, I say too, like getting, getting clean and sober doesn't mean your problems go away. No. But now you can, you can deal with your problems on life's terms. Right. Instead of like every little thing in the past when I was using, like any little thing felt like this giant exactly. mountain I had to right. overcome. So I need, I need a bracer and I need a line to overcome this huge thing I got to face. And it wasn't huge at all. Right. And I could have faced it easily, but uh, my, my addiction's saying we got to, we'll face it together as a team. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that goes well. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, um, and I don't even know what's good for me. This is the, this is the insight. I don't trust my own self-assessment uh, because the worst thing you know, in my drunken state that ever could have happened would, would be that I was publicly exposed and humiliated for what a sham I had become. And that happened. It, that's what I, it happened. The worst <laughs> thing happened. And, um, but it, and it turned out to be the best thing that happened. So, so that, that suspicion of my own ability to assess continues. I go, well, I don't know. Let's, let's see what happens. Uh, this seems to be a you know kind of pretty painful and awful, but I don't know. I do not know, you know. I mean, because God has so often used those moments to show up, 
you know, um, there's a there's a line in a praise hymn that I love so much, and it says, "I will joy in every battle because because I know that's where you'll be." You know, it's like a prayer. I know you're going to show up, so bring it on. I, I let's go. Yeah, you know. Yeah, you know, you being outed, like thinking that's the worst thing that could have possibly happened. I guarded, I guarded my secret of abuse like I had this. <laughs> Like bag of diamonds inside of me. Right. Like nobody's gonna find out about this. Right. And the worst thing that could have, in my mind, that I envisioned is that that would be you know released to the world. And because you know I want to be the the cool party macho guy, you know, <laughs> right. running with bikers and strip bars and women and drinking and and you know abuse doesn't fit in with that. And so the worst thing would be that. That abuse would become made public, and it become made public, and it was the right. great greatest thing that could have freed me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and it freed you. It absolutely did. Yeah, it absolutely did. And yeah. and and that's what I you know I I tell people like you know you got to break your silence right. you know and, and and break your silence for for addiction or for abuse you know just being you know being vulnerable and being open right. is the only way to grow and heal and 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 get on with life right you know right. secrets kill. Yep. And, and you know, I, somebody somebody went to AA once and they're like, I'm never going back to that. It's a bunch of sniveling drunks talking about their problems. Who wants to hear that? <laughs> and I'm like, well, that's how you heal. <laughs> that's the whole purpose yeah. is that you're, you're not living a lie. Right. Exactly. And, and so, wow. Uh, I wasn't really expecting all that today. <laughs> <laughs> well. You know, fascinating yeah it's a great life it really yeah, is no, yeah, so. and, and it makes you know i do i i started this podcast to give people a voice and to give the people listening oh, we all think we're alone with what we're dealing with mm -hmm. like oh nobody will understand this well the, the priest is a is a mess <laughs> everybody's a mess yeah. like we're all yeah. going through crap yep and, yeah. and so I, that's why i want people to just be like all right He's a mess. Clark's a mess. They're doing all right. I, I guess I can get better and I can heal and I can get sober and my life doesn't have to be so bad. Yeah. And yeah. That's, that's the whole point of this. Exactly. And, you know, whatever agony we went through to get here, we can see how it benefits other people. We can offer it to other people. And it does. People get hope, you know, to sort of see somebody that made it. And, um, you know, and we have that, that kind of like um, uh, authenticity about about being alive and overcoming. So. I can't thank you enough for being here. Oh, my pleasure. Oh, it was like, fascinating. Really, I, I mean, stuff. I, I laughed <laughs> so much. My <laughs> nose is running. My eyes are tearing. I can't wait for to get this camera to end so I can blow my nose. <laughs> you had me dying. Yeah. <laughs> you got a great thing going on here, Clark. Oh, you really do. man. Thanks, so, Robert. Yeah, it was thanks. awesome. Thanks Very for being good. here. Yeah, my pleasure. Well, everybody, that was another episode of Free Like Me. This was amazing. You are not alone with what you're facing in life. We are all dealing with crap. So stop self-destructing. Start healing. Reach out to me, Free Like Me coaching program. And please hit the subscribe button when you listen to this episode. See you next week. Peace. <laughs>